Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. Today's video, I'm going to be comparing kestrels to merlins, which is a fun topic and one I'm actually kind of surprised I haven't gone over before. Before I do though, uh, if you haven't already, if you can hit subscribe, please do. It uh, really does help me build up this channel. I'm trying to get it up and going and get this information out. And please share your comments, your thoughts, the things you like, dislike, what you want to talk about, uh, not just for my benefit uh, with making these videos, but also to build more of a falconry community around the world, to interconnect all of us, to share ideas, uh, innovations that come about in different parts of the world. So when uh, jumping into the subject though, falconry is of course been around for thousands of years. Uh, and I got into it back in the 1900s. So I came in an odd time uh, in the United States where I'm at, there's uh, very uh, strict regimented laws and policies. And when I got into it originally, the laws were that a, a, a beginning falcon or an apprentice could only have either a red-tailed hawk, which is very large bootio, a soaring hawk, or an American kestrel. And in both of these cases, we had to trap it from the wild as your first bird. You had to. It was mandated and train it. And then there's ranks, of course, in the United States, you know, an apprentice, a general class, then a master class. And what would usually happen is uh, most falconers, most sponsors who are training you as an apprentice would say, hey, you know what? Don't get a kestrel. That's just a toy. You know, you can learn some basics and fundamentals with them, but it's not a real game hawk. Get a red-tailed hawk. That'll prepare you for a big bird. It'll learn the management, the safety. And a lot of these uh, mentors were all flying large falcons. They were flying prairie falcons, peregrine falcons, jeer falcons, and uh, even jeer peregrine hybrids. And so uh, for us apprentices moving through the ranks, we kind of looked at that. Oh, what are what are the really respected old timers and uh, people with, with all this experience? What are they flying? Large falcons in open country on stunning quarry like sage, sage grouse and ducks and pheasants and, and sharp-tailed grouse, things like that. So that's what we look to. Now the world is changing. It's shifted a lot. Um, <clears throat> and, and so here in my area, you no longer have to have those two as your first bird. And also, micro-hawking has really taken off and has come, especially as the world is becoming more and more urban and it's harder to find larger upland game and waterfowl species accessible for falconry, hunting smaller quarry like starlings and sparrows and doves and things like that uh, is very sporting. And so because of that, micro-hawking is being seen increasingly as a great way to practice the art of falconry in the modern world, which I'm, that's great, that's wonderful. Now Merlins are an interesting one too, because when I was young getting into falconry, people were flying Merlins as well, and uh, but they were kind of the oddballs off to the side. People who were, if you watch my videos, you know how enamored I am with lander falcons. That, that was usually the Merlin guys. The Merlin guys were somebody who just fell in love with Merlins and was flying them, doing amazing things, but not many people were flying them. It was kind of a little niche group on the side there. And now people are seeing far more the merits of Kestrels and Merlins, and I'm, they're, they're having a very prolific use here in the United States, which is wonderful in my mind. So uh, we got to take a look at both of these. I will touch on uh, Old World Kestrels a little bit as well as part of this, but basically we're going to be talking about the Merlin, and the American kestrel. So in the United States, uh, these two birds, the American kestrel is our only native kestrel species. Most other regions of the world that have all your old world kestrels, you might have one, two, three, four, five kestrel species in one region. That's not how it is here. Here we have just one. From Canada all the way down to Argentina and everywhere in between, we have one kestrel, the American kestrel. Their, their coloration is a bit different regionally. And it is true that both on the east and west coast of the United States and Canada, we do occasionally get Eurasian kestrels that migrate in and have, have, have set up shop, as it were. But they're not, we don't really see them. It's an oddity. It's a rare thing. 
Okay. So kestrels, the American kestrel is actually one of the smallest kestrels in the world. Uh, kestrels are a true falcon, but they branched off of the line that, that, that falcon evolution was going much earlier than the rest of the other current modern day falcons. And so all kestrels you can kind of see, you know, of course the males are smaller than the females, which is normal with raptors. But uh, in most cases, the male will have some sort of blue Every kestrel species, typically, the male will have a, a, some blue that the female won't have, and the female will be more red covered. And that's true with our kestrels here in the United States, uh, is that, yes, indeed, the females are red and black and have a little bit of blue on the head, but the males have these brilliant blue wings and quite a different tail. Kestrels are the least falcon of the falcons we have in North America, in my opinion. And what I mean by that is when I hear the word falcon, I am normally picturing, okay, we're talking about long, uh, a bird with a lot of mass, very dense, okay? Uh, sh long, skinny wings. And when it's flying, it's building up momentum. A bird that pr wants open country, wants to dive, and typically wants to catch avian prey. When I hear falcon, that's what... That's the definition line that pops into my head. Kestrels are not that way. Kestrels fill a, a niche that works incredibly well for them, which uh, is largely hunting rodents and insects. They do hunt birds in the wild, but in my region, they're mostly going off after mice and rats and voles and gophers and things like that. And in, when the warm season, they're hunting a lot of insects. Now in the United States, and they will also hunt, especially in the more desert and more tropical areas, a lot of rodents. I, sorry, a, a lot of reptiles, occasionally snakes, like garter snakes, things like that, but quite often lizards. Uh, and when you're getting into tropical areas, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Florida, some of these areas where it's it's tropical, legitimately tropical, then again, their prey base is almost entirely uh, tree-dwelling reptiles at that point. But they're built really for rodents, which if you see my videos on foot comparison, uh, long skinny toes are good for catching birds. Short thick toes, little sausage toes, eh, are good for catching rodents. Rodents have uh, these four front incisor teeth that are meant for cutting, biting, chewing, tearing, but they're just four razor sharp chisels that grow their entire life. Flesh is nothing against those. Uh, I'm more terrified of being bitten bad by an angry tree squirrel than a dog. They just they could tear you to pieces so quickly. So if you are a rodent hunter, uh, yeah, sure, you want to be swift, take out your prey as quickly as you can, but they still might turn around and bite you. So th short toes, thick toes are a benefit for that way. Kestrels are built as such. Yes, they're tiny. And so, yes, being as small as they are, you might be like, oh, they've got little skinny toes. For their size, even though their toes are small compared to us, their toes are actually quite thickly built uh, and quite short. Perfect rodent catching tools. Uh, also really good for flying insects. If you have a really long uh, toe span and you're trying to catch a little tiny dragonfly or a moth flying in the air, you might kind of over wrap, it's kind of hard. You know, you might, you'll touch them, but you're gonna kind of miss. And so having shorter, if you aim well, <clears throat> then you've, you've got them, you've got them really good. Uh, that, that's what you need. And so kestrels, you've got a bird that is built for hunting rodents and insects and reptiles and occasionally birds. That's the base that you're dealing with in the wild. Kestrels are very, they're very buoyant. They have a low wing loading, which means for the size and uh, surface area covered by their wings, they're not very heavy. Now, of course, they're not heavy because they're small, but I'm saying if you shrink a merlin or a peregrine down to the size magically of a kestrel, it will be a much denser, heavier bird, even measuring the same size. Because of that, kestrels are, I, I view them as little butterflies with little jetpacks, okay? They're just, they're buoyant and they can hover. All kestrels can hover. Uh, I don't have footage of American kestrels hovering, but the ability for a kestrel to hover, such as this Eurasian kestrel, is the ability to, in one place, very similar to a helicopter, stay with your head motionless. So your wings are flapping, your tail's moving, but you're basically staying motionless in the air. And that is really good when you're a rodent hunter because rodents are not a chase. 
Rodents are an ambush. If you have a rodent that comes out of a burrow, it's looking around and the kestrel starts to dive down on it and then it, oh no, goes back in. Then if you stay in one place and hover over it and hoping when it comes out to see if the coast is clear, boom, you just pounce on it. So that is one of the things that kestrels are known for. Kestrels of all kinds is they are buoyant and they can hover. Now, for a large falcon like a peregrine to do that, I mean, I've had peregrines that do that for a few seconds. I had a an, an autumn peregrine that um, when he was first learning, when he, he went and he, he dove down on his first chucker partridge, boom, hit it, and woo, went down in a bush, and he's like, whoa, and he circled around, and he did hover. He went, but he, it, it went hover, 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 and then I flushed it, and then he went and got it. So yeah, most birds are capable of hovering for a few seconds, but kestrels can really, they're so buoyant and so tiny in their mass that they can do it for an extended period. Very few people have ever tried to utilize that ability in falconry uh, as a hunting technique, but it's something to know the mindset of them is ambush rather than chase. Their musculature is, for a falcon, comparatively weak meaning the muscles, the flight muscles themselves. So they are not what will be considered a powerful flyer. They are fast when they want to be, but they are not a powerful flyer. And pursuit is not their best course of action, but they are fast. So for me personally, when I have hunted kestrels, uh, hunting a kestrel off the fist or having it on a perch where you flush prey towards them, that can work well. But you do not expect them to do a big, long, prolonged chase. It's like you have to try to orchestrate a hunting setup that provides them enough advantage that that uh, you're you're pushing the odds more in their favor. Okay, so that could be like again, like maybe you have them go fly up to you see a bush full of sparrows and you have them fly up to the top of a barn and you go to the other side and you start walking towards them. You start swinging a lure. The falcon starts coming. Kestrel starts coming down and then you charge the bush and the sparrows fly away from you. Right as rash, the kestrel catches them. Okay, uh, there's stuff like that, that you can do with a kestrel to create some sort of an advantage for them. That is. Uh, one of the reasons why people have, in the earlier days of United States falconry, have kind of shied away from them. They're like, well, it's not as sporting. But if you love kestrels and uh, you have the game available and the setups available, what a great species to use. I have known people who have flown them on rodents, which seems strange to me. But again, I, on this channel, I always try to promote being open-minded and looking at different ways of doing things. Uh, I had a friend who north of me would just go out in the farm fields and let the kestrel go up there and he'd just walk around and he, if a mouse appeared, whoop, and then he'd go pick up the kestrel. But the kestrel was having a great old time. My friend was having a great old time. So, hey, there you go. But Normally, most people with kestrels in the United States are trying to hunt birds, and the birds they're chasing are typically going to be uh, starlings or kest uh, starlings or, or sparrows, English sparrows, and both of those are prey species that are not protected. They're invasive and cause a lot of damage, so it's a positive thing to have your kestrel going after them. If you are considering a kestrel, another plus is the fact that you don't have to have telemetry. Now that kestrels are gaining in popularity, a lot of people are choosing to try to do telemetry. It's a fine balancing act, in my opinion. Uh, I think you can never go wrong doing a properly sized transmitter for a bird, but the other rule is you always want to have as little weight inhibiting your bird as possible. You want to keep your jesses as small as possible while large enough to provide the proper strength. You want a hood to be as lightweight as possible. Everything, bells, anything you might use. And the same thing goes with a transmitter. I personally have never used a transmitter on my American Kestrels, and I have never lost one uh, from, that, from not having uh, radio telemetry or GPS telemetry on them. It's never been a problem for me. But I am not discouraging its use. I'm just saying that if you are wise in how you fly, then it is most, it's one of the few birds that you can fly without telemetry and not be too worried about losing them. So that is a plus to them. So your, your flights will not be as spirited as with other raptors, but you're going to have a fairly close by, fairly loyal bird and uh, a bird that is fairly easy to keep in good shape because they don't have that density and they're so buoyant. So it's easy to get them to do 
ambush chases, uh, just direct pursuit chases, or like I said, let them fly up somewhere and you, you flush prey towards them that they can go and catch. So in all those things, again, keep an open mind. If you want to use a drone or a kite or a balloon to train your kestrel to wait on like a big falcon, go for it. If you want to have your kestrel hunting mice and voles that, as you walk around a farm field and that brings you joy, hey, you're getting out, your bird's having fun, you're having a good time, great. But for the recommendation, if you are considering them, again, remember, short, direct pursuit flights where you have to try to orchestrate as much advantage as possible and you're dealing with a bird with, with very powerful grip but very short, stumpy toes. Consider it. Now, merlins. Merlins are not that much bigger than kestrels by measurements, uh, by weight, by wing length, by height, even by hood size. They're not that much different, but they are a totally different bird. Merlins are, and in the United States, we have uh, three recognized subspecies. We have the, the Richardsons, which are the very light birds, uh, and, and we have the columbaris, which are a bit darker, and the suclei, which are normally called the black merlins out of the Pacific Northwest. And depending on your region, people have different views on how dark you have to be in order to be a suclei. But what I'm talking about with merlins applies to all three of the subspecies that come through my area. To me, a merlin's a merlin. Uh, and so what you have with a merlin is a bird, yeah, it's microhawking, but it's either the biggest of the little birds, of the biggest of the little falcons, or the smallest of the big falcons. It's right there because it has speed and stamina and power and acceleration and agility right up there with the big falcons and even exceeding many of the big falcons. Uh, but simultaneously, it's so small. And you know how there's there's some relativity when it comes to weight, right? Like if you drop a grasshopper off of a off of a building and it falls down and it hits the ground, it'll be like, okay, and walk away. There's that relativity of weight, right? Where if you drop off me, I splat. Uh, so even though we're going the same distance and the same speed, it's the same thing when it comes to flight. And a Merlin, if you get a certain size, then your lift and your thrust, you're putting so much more into it. Where if you get small, like a kestrel or a pygmy falcon or a falconet, you know, falconets are just ridiculously tiny little old world falcons. And then get smaller when you're getting down into flying insects, a moth, a butterfly. Uh, when you get down to the size of a moth or a butterfly, flight for them is much closer to swimming. The density has of the atmosphere has not changed, but the density relative to their mass and size and the pull of the earth has changed because they're so small. So again, some of these small flying insects, it's almost like swimming when they're going through the air because of that relativity of mass. So when we're dealing with Merlins, Merlins, my opinion, my experience, is that a Merlin is the perfect size, just big enough to be big to have power and mass and momentum to just, just fire through our dense atmosphere, but light enough that it can be more about thrust and less about lift, okay? They're just small enough to be buoyant, but just big enough to have that. And that's, that's in my opinion, why you don't see a wider range, why, why Merlins didn't get you know bigger, like even the size of an Oplomato, perhaps. They never got, you never see them that big. They're just kind of this perfect size. And that is the perfect size for long, athletic pursuit of birds. Now, Merlins aren't picky, especially in the spring, uh, about going after insects. Uh, especially young Merlins out of the nest are happy to catch flying insects, but they are built for birds. That's what they're meant to do. The toes of a Merlin are ridiculously long. They are oversized for their size, in my opinion. Uh, and they are even proportionately as long or longer than peregrine toes. And about the only falcon that has, for its body size, proportionally longer toes would be the orange-breasted falcon of tropical New World. So what are those toes for? Bird catching. Those toes would get bit off so easily by a rodent if they were rodent hunters. They are built to catch birds out of the air. If you are considering a merlin, the bad part about that athleticism is you might as well be flying a jeer falcon. You're going to have to have radio telemetry or GPS telemetry 
of some type. Me personally, uh, I've tried different types and what I like to use for them is a backpack mount with a micro transmitter from Marshall Radio Telemetry. That's what I personally use on my Merlins. It's worked well. I know people who have different views. That's fine. I'm just sharing you what works well for me. Uh, and, and having a backpack mount is something that keeps the center of gravity centered and helps them utilize their amazing mass-driven thrust. They are often used for flock hawking. A lot of people like to just say, hey, I'm going to go drive somewhere. Oh, there's a flock of 10,000 European starlings. Cool. I'm going to let them out the window. They go fly up to a telephone pole, and I'm just going to watch. They puff up. They go to the bathroom, rouse, and then they're like, oh, 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 oh there's a flock of starlings a half a mile away. Ooh. And then they start going after them, build speed, build speed, build speed, and then they're chasing them up, going up, going up, working them just like a shark chasing a, a school of fish. And it is breathtaking to watch. It's even abstract. Just watching the patterns when you have this uh, this mass of all these, you know, 100,000 starlings and all of a sudden, whoosh, they stretch out and divide it into two as the Merlin dives through. And then they come back together and they, you know, just like a super organism there. It's strange. It's cool to watch. A lot of people do that. Uh, a lot of people do what I mentioned earlier, which is where you take uh, a Merlin, put it up somewhere. You've got birds in this bush, sparrows or whatever, and you start swinging the lure over here. Merlin comes and you charge the bush and they come out, catches them. I do that with pigeons. I love Merlins are my pigeon hunting bird. There is nothing I love hunting pigeons more with, the wild, feral pigeons, rock dove pigeon, right, than Merlins. Uh, I'll do it in direct pursuit. I'll do it, uh, you know, the way I just described. And in this way, I also like to do doves, both morning doves and Eurasian collared doves that are non-native. But the important thing, whatever you choose to hunt with a Merlin, what you have to remember is extreme athleticism. You have a much higher performance bird. So you have to make sure that you are hunting in an area where you have space, and if you don't have space where there's buildings or a lot of private land or whatever, make sure you can access them legally so that if there's a problem, if your bird's like, whoa, boom, and I caught this and now I'm on top of a building, can you go get on top of that building? Well, do you, can you get permission? Uh, you better, that's a problem that doesn't happen much with a kestrel. But when you, because the kestrel's like, whoop, I caught it, or whoop, I missed, okay, I'm gonna fly back to you or land on the nearest tree. Or a Merlin's like, okay, I'm chasing, da -da 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 -da. Oh, you know, two miles later, you're boop, 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 using your telemetry, trying to track down this bird. And you have to factor that in. So if you want to fly a Merlin, you're in for a wonderful treat. You're going to have a lot of fun and a fabulous experience. Uh, but you're going to have to have telemetry and you have to be wiser about where you hunt than you do with a Kestrel. Humans don't think in three dimensions when it comes to the sky. Um, I, 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 if you go back through my videos, there's one where I just showed with a drone the perspective of a falcon from the sky and how insignificant we are. We just think, well, I'm on this road. Why are you on the next road? It's like there's this whole – pilots understand. Pilots get it. There's this whole three-dimensional world that your bird can go anywhere, and we don't think about it that way. A merlin can get up and go. A kestrel is wired much more like us. The distances that kestrels are thinking are much more the way a human thinks. So in that sense, a kestrel is a good intro bird if you're just uh, dipping your toes into the sport. Um, but here's the other thing about both of those birds. All birds require religious dedication to weight management. You have to be so good about your weight management. But when you're dealing with birds this small, it's all the more important. You have to be on spot, at least to the gram, to the hour. You have to know exactly how much you fed them, what is their rate of dropping. This is very easy to chart. Uh, I have this down, again, I, one of my videos on weight management, but you, you, it's easy to do, but you have to do it. Otherwise, your bird is dead, which is a tragedy. You can't have that happen. You're in, the, you're in charge of uh, the care of this bird. So if you have a micro of any kind, that is the first thing. Weight management, weight management, weight management. You cannot be sloppy about it. You must be religious about it. But if you do it right, you're going to have a heck of a great time flying either a Merlin or a Kestrel, both. Um, but again, just remember those kind of those principles I mentioned of what you're going after. It's not that one bird is better than the other. It's take an honest look at your situation. What time do you have? What prey do you have? What space do you have to fly in? Can you afford radio telemetry? Those are all factors 
when choosing which of these two would be a better micro for you. Now, old world Kestrels. The only ones I've personally flown have been uh, common Kestrels. They're also called Eurasian Kestrels, or sometimes they're called rock Kestrels. I don't know why. It's like, well, because they perch on a rock. But Eurasian Kestrels are strange because you have American Kestrel, Merlin, and then you have Eurasian Kestrels. Eurasian Kestrels are bigger than Merlin's, but they're still physiologically built like a Kestrel. So you would think, oh, so it's an even bigger falcon, so even more athletic. Nope. They are more far-ranging and more athletic and more powerful than an American Kestrel. But I find American Kestrels to be much faster, uh, much flashier, and they can use that buoyancy. So they're little short flights, but they, to me, it's a more athletic flight. The Eurasian Kestrels, I have flown both male and female. They are every bit as buoyant as an American Kestrel, maybe even more so not by weight, but by size and breadth of the wings. And what that will result in is a bit of lethargicness on the chase. So just like any Kestrel, they are mostly an ambush predator. Just like an American Kestrel in the wild, they would like to hunt rodents and they would like to be above them and to dive down on them and to catch them off guard. And just like American kestrels, if the rodent, if they start their dive and the rodent goes underground, they'll hover in one place and then phew, and dive down. So same idea, but much larger to the point that you could catch pigeons and doves with them, which I have. Uh, but again, I had to, just like with an American kestrel, I had to orchestrate it uh, in a way that gave a lot of advantage to the kestrel to be able to do it because a direct pursuit isn't going to happen. Um, that being said, they are, I don't know how to de fully describe them. It's almost like a goshawk and you're pursuing rabbits versus a red-tailed hawk pursuing rabbits. They can both do it, but it's like a goshawk can do it with its eyes closed, like with, with one hand behind, tied behind my back and a patch over one eye. I'll blah, blah, blah. Where a red-tailed hawk, you got to encourage him. You got to build up that understanding of, yeah, you can really do this and build up the muscle. And then, yeah, they can go hunt jackrabbits and chase them and get them. That's how I feel about Eurasian kestrels. Eurasian kestrels can hunt a lot of pretty impressive prey. But just like a red-tailed hawk, you have to uh, encourage them, provide a lot of uh, training ahead of time to where they've built up their competence on that prey species. And then you have to really work the musculature. It's not just a matter of finding the right weight. It's get rid of the fat, build up the muscle, and get them into kind of an athlete. Where, I mean, <laughs> an out-of-shape goss female goshawk in my mind is can out out chase a jackrabbit better than an in-shape red-tailed hawk in a lot of cases. Uh, I, some people may give me a little pushback on that, but personal experience, it just seems just the natural build of them. And that's how I feel about it with a Eurasian kestrel. So among those three, again, remember, American kestrel, short-range ambush or direct pursuit predator, able to hunt prey like sparrows and starlings, but need a lot of confidence and training to get them to do so. A species that you don't have to use telemetry if you're wise. A bird that thinks more like us spatially. Merlins, totally different. Merlins uh, are, 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 they can do direct pursuit, but they do better if there is, instead of like, get me as close as you can to the prey. A Merlin does better if they have some space few hundred yards, half a mile. Some people even fly them a mile away from a flock so that they can build up full speed and that their mass just carry them through and just knife through that flock like it's nothing. That's a very different mindset spatially from a human or a kestrel. And so again, with a Merlin, you're going to have an amazing time, but you're going to have to use telemetry no matter what. Eurasian kestrel, Kind of halfway in between. Eurasian Kestrel, I would not fly a Eurasian Kestrel without telemetry personally. I know a lot of old, I have a friends, a lot of friends across the ocean who do, who fly them without telemetry. I never would because they can range farther than American Kestrels, but nowhere near like a Merlin does. Uh, and all three of these birds are thrilling and a joy to fly to the lure. You're going to stoop them to the lure and have them dive and dive and have a great old time just to exercise them or do some pursuit training. All three of these birds will do great. Merlin's going to give you the most bang for your buck just because they just the speed and agility, mind-blowing. But again, all three of them, fun birds, great for micro-hawking, 
but all they have their differences, they have their strengths and their weaknesses, and just think it through. Again, we all know falconer's perfect, especially me. I know I'm not. Uh, sometimes we get so fired up about a species, we get a species we shouldn't be getting with where we're at in life or with what prey we have available. But I hope this video helps you self-reflect and make good choices in that matter. If you're thinking of falconry, if you're thinking of microhawking and you've already been a falconer, think these three through and be like, hey, what's my scenario? Which bird would work best? And even though maybe I like this species more, maybe this is a species that would be better for me to work with right now. So I hope that comparison is of value to you. Uh, let me know down in the comments uh, what your thoughts are and what your personal experiences have been with these species, especially if you've worked with old world kestrels, pygmy falcons, falconets, let us know on here because uh, those of us in the new world you do have, rarely have opportunities to hear about those experiences. Uh, please hit subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, happy hockey.